Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Across from me is sitting a man uh, whose name is very famous, Alan Dawil Jr. Now, in South Africa, we've got some boxing families. You've got the Steins, you've got the Malingas, but the most famous one of them are the Tawil family. Welcome, Alan. Welcome. Thank you. No, thank nice you to have much. you here, finally. Appreciate it. Thank you. And, uh, okay, we're going to go way back. You know, uh, your grandfather, Mike Tawil, yes. he was a guy who started it way back. He was also a professional fighter. Yes. And he had a bunch of sons. How many Tawil boys all in all? He had six of them. Six of them. And all of them, bar your one uncle, Maurice, who was struck by polio in yes. a wheelchair. So all, five others all boxed. Maurice promoted and managed. Yes. And his sugar boy, Malinga, among many yes. others. Among many others. And, uh, and so they all boxed. But your most famous uncle was, of course, Victor Wheel, who became South Africa's first world champion in 1950, winning the world bantamweight uh, uh, title. Yes. I think you, you were not born even then, yes. long yes. back. Oh. Uh, and what were your memories from that growing up? You must have been aware of it. Yes. Look, Uncle Vic was South Africa's first world champion. And till today, South Africa's only undisputed world champion. And I say that with pride, because to become an undisputed world champion today is such a difficult thing. You know? And back in the day, there were only eight divisions. Mm, correct. So for the family, it was a, such a big, big thing when he won the title. And I, these stories have been told to me on numerous occasions by my grandfather. He's passed and my late father, he's passed. That night he won, there were close to 2,000 people at the house. It was just packed, you know, and it was such a proud moment. Um, that it was first undisputed world champion, you know. And from what I remember, from what I've been told about my Uncle Vic, uh, a tremendous fighter, two-fisted attack fighter, non-stop punching. He would throw an average of about 180 punches around. Um, and... That's how he built his career, you know? Yes, uh, not a lot of footage available of your uncle, unfortunately. Yes. I think the best is on Alan's own YouTube channel, where you've got yes. that fighter series yes. uh, that's sort of loosely based on the Chris Fadenstein book. Yes. And there's some good footage, but a, but a tremendous pressure fighter, volume puncher yes. that I can yes. tell from, from those things. And now the, 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 the funny thing is, Vic won it in 1950, and he lost it in 1952. Yes. He made three title defenses. So in today's world, you'd think, uh, okay, that's what he did in those three years. But here's an interesting piece of trivia. In that time period, between 1950 and 1952, he fought 13 times. Yes. Because he was SA champion, Commonwealth champion as well. And the strange thing, looking at it from today, they hung on to their Commonwealth and SA yes. titles. And in between the three world title defenses that he made, he also defended both. Yes. What was the reasoning behind it? Uh, did guys need to fight that regularly to make money? The, was it just the way it went? The reality of it is they couldn't uh, produce title defenses. It's also money. Mm. Lack of money, lack of sponsorship. Because mm. ideally speaking, if it was in today's time, yeah. there would have had 13 title, world title defenses. <coughs> you know? yeah. So, But you have to keep active. And the guys he fought were also top rated fighters. Mm. So you also beat them over 10 rounds instead of 59 yeah. title defense. Yes. So the biggest reason is, is as a promoter, the promoter that day didn't have the finances to promote every single fight as a world title fight. Do you, do you think uh, you also try and keep your guys active? Yes. Most of you guys may fight regularly yes. in today's terms. Akani Puzi has fought quite a, quite a bit. Yes. Um, so do you, uh, do, do you try and uh, you try and keep them active, but do you think there's a point where it's too much activity? 13 fights in two years, is that perhaps too much? Well, in those days, it was like fight. a norm yes, to fight yeah. regularly. In actual fact, when he won the world title, it was only it was his 14th fight. Now, mm. the majority of fighters those days would have 50 to 40 fights before they won a world title. Mm. So what he, that, what he did was exceptional you know, mm. in those mm. days, in the 50s. Mm. Um, but I think today, guys should fight regularly at least four to five times their building their mm. careers. Mm. Kind of like they did with Mike Tyson. Yes, the beginning. yes. And then they'll end up being super champions. They you know, they'll get so much experience. But today we don't have that. Um, there's a lack of fighters fighting regularly, regularly. And the other thing is, we're too concerned of letting our guys have a win win record all the time. Yes. If our guys lose, so be it. If you, you can know, learn through a loss. If you can learn through a loss, yeah, let him have a return match mm. or uh, bring him back, you know. So we're afraid today to have that loss on our record.
So you would agree there's too much emphasis on that O these days? Yes, I believe it's too much today. You know? Yeah, something we can maybe learn from mixed martial arts. It's not yeah. a big deal. Not a big deal. Just, you don't want the guy to get hammered or no, take a lot of punishment or if not stung exactly, called out. You know, exactly. But there's something as a competitive loss. He's, if he's had a good fight yeah. and he's put up a good fight, he hasn't been severely punished and he's lost the fight, so be it. Let's move on, build him back again, you know, understand? And, and keep on like that. Until he's, uh, the biggest thing is as long as the guy's he has the willingness and the determination to continue in the career of boxing. Let's keep on pushing this guy. One more famous that we'll have to touch on before we get to you is, is your other uncle, Willie Tawil. Yeah. Now, he fought Robert Cohen for the World Bantamweight uh, yeah. title, yeah. and he got a draw. A lot of people thought he should have won it. Yeah. Uh, but he was also, now get this, it was kind of like a local Henry Armstrong figure, a South African Bantamweight, featherweight, lightweight, and welterweight champion, yeah. and the Commonwealth, or back that as they are called the Empire, yeah, Empire, Empire yeah. uh, uh, lightweight champion. Yes, that's correct. Yes, yeah, like okay, and that was your uncle Willie. Yes. And uh, and he went through all these weight classes. Today it would seem incredible. What do you, how do you think he did it? What was the okay? The idea? reason yeah. behind it is simple. My my father learned from the mistakes that my grandfather made. Mm. My grandfather never moved my uncle Vic up. Yes. You know. He kept it was it difficult because then there's no yes, titles around like today. Yes, it was very difficult because yeah. then you had to move to yeah. the featherweight division. Yeah. And the world featherweight champion at that stage was Willie Peck. Yes. And he was exceptional. Yes. You know, and, and there was no junior featherweight. Yes. So he kept him as a bantamweight. And then and then the world champion you have to stand in line, line for it, which you That's don't have the choice of four guys yes, like now. Yes, 100%. Mm -hmm. You have one world champion. So and you to be in the top so that 10. leads to the weight reducing. Exactly. And to be in the top 10 in those days was something really special. Yes. You with me? Yeah. Willie, on the other hand, as he, as he couldn't make the weight, my father moved up to another And Of course, also the other reason is he had, he had the height yes. and he had the power. Yes. You see. Unfortunately, with Willie, after he knocked out Esikov, and Esikov mm. never regained yeah. consciousness, yeah. Um, that slowed Willie's knockout uh, power. So he, yes. couldn't, he didn't want to knock out guys, he wanted to beat them on points. And if you yes. can see, if you, look at, if you analyze his record, the first 21 fights, it was 15 knockouts. Yes. The rest of the fights, up until his 56 fight, he he he, won, he only had seven stoppages. Yes. You know? And the reason behind that because that was a, that affected him very badly. He would hit the guy. He was such a good boxer. He boxes were out of trouble. You know. Yeah. And win on points. So yeah. yeah. And then now coming to you, your dad, Alan Senior, uh, yeah. had a pro career as well, a long one. Yes. But uh, he became a, a very well-known trainer with many fighters. But, but I think the the, 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 the most well-known one. That was, was uh, Pierre Fury. And Willie also, he trained Willie. And, and, and Willie as well, and he was also in the corner of Vic, I think. Yes, as an assistant. As an assistant. They so, started off as an assistant. Yeah. He was he was, he was far with Vic. Then he took, he trained Willie. Right, yes. In actual fact, at that stage in 1955, he was the youngest trainer in the world to train a guy for a world title fight. He was only 23 years old. And and yeah. you obviously learned the game from your father, Alan yes. Senior, and the rest of your family probably as well. Absolutely. Uh, because I, I tell you why it was. It was like every single lunchtime on a Sunday, mm. we would talk one thing, and that's boxing. And but and we would talk about all the old fighters, and then for hours and hours. And there was a, in in our my grandmother's lounge. There was a big portrait of Dick. Yes. And we'd have lunch lunch there, and we'd talk. And then my aunt was a nun. Yeah. Your aunt was a nun. Yes, she's okay. a nun. <laughs> she would the cry. She was very emotional. <laughs> <laughs> she was she was very really emotional with yes. with the, with uh, about her brothers. You know? yes. So it was a very really, it was just an ongoing constantly about boxing, boxing, boxing. You know? you and you learn a lot. You had to get I I had to get into this thing. You guys also went overseas quite a bit. Yes, uh, and I went, learned from people there. Hundred percent. When I went, I went with my dad. First of all, we went to the Windy City gym mm. in Chicago. And we saw some heavy stuff, heavy sparring in those mm. days. You know when guys spar, mm. they spar to mm. knock you. Yes. Uh, and I remember when Pierre Pizza was supposed to be with a few heavyweights, then my father just said, no, back off, stay away from this. Mm, yeah. And we went to, uh, we met, I met my uh, Angela Dundee. Yes. And just talking to the man, you learn so much from the man, I mean, you know, train Shira Leonard and, and um, Muhammad Ali. You just need to listen for an hour or so to these guys. Eddie yeah. Fudge, who trained really far, yes. he was an exceptional so man. Many, many I had the privilege of being in the restroom room when he was wrapping hands for the Pierre Pierce fight. And I was just watching yeah, how yeah. he does it. You were so the the goods of camp, yes. but he was with Roddy Bowe. Yeah, he was with Roddy Bowe at this stage. And he used to come, he had a few fighters that came over here that fought a few of my dad's yes. fighters. One in particular, I remember Bushy Best, that fought Steve Delgado, Delgado yes. in the late, early 80s, you know. 
So he came quite often to South Africa, Eddie Fudge, you know. And I, you know, in my opinion, Eddie Fudge is probably one of the best trainers of all time. You know? Yes. Next I think many song. people rate, rate him very highly as a yeah. trainer. Yeah. Now, you started working in the corner with your dad. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a bit about Pierre Kutsa because that's a name that, that the, the guys overseas also recognize a little bit. He was South African heavyweight champion. Uh, your dad was in the opposite corner when he fought Benny Kutsa. Yeah. Great fight. People always talk <laughs> about Johnny the Play and Pierre Kutsa, which was a great fight, sort of a hagler in of heavyweights. But go to YouTube and go find Pierre Kutsa against Benny Kutsa as well. Very similar sort of knock him down, drag him out fight. Yeah. Your dad trained Benny Kutsa at that yes. time. Yeah. And who was also a pretty good heavyweight in his own right, yeah. Benny Kutsa. Uh, good pressure fighter, not a great chin. I think that's yeah. what hurt him. That's weird. That's weird. But, but he had Pierre beaten six times and then Pierre charged back, knocked out Benny Kutsa, and then your dad started training Pierre. Yes. After yeah. Pierre, Pierre lost to um, the cruiserweight, uh, Jesus, Benton. Bernard, Bernard Benton, yes, yes former the WBC cruiserweight. After the, yeah, time. former WBC. Yeah. I remember watching that fight with my dad. And Pierre was taking a lot of punishment yeah. for 10 rounds. Yeah. And ben, Benton beat him fairly and squarely. Yeah. He came to my dad at after and then he had a return match. Then knocked out Benton. Yes, and I'll never forget that because I was working out with Pierre. He never had sparring. So I would work with Pierre, just throwing the same punch, imitating Bernard Benton. Yes. You know? And to the T, the way the fight went, the way we practiced in the gym, yeah. that's how the fight went, and he knocked him out in one round with a perfectly timed left hook. Yes, yeah. remember and, well. Yeah, mm. And that's sort of boosting his career. Yeah. And now if you talk about uh, your dad and Pierre Kutzer, it was almost sort of a father-son relationship in a way. Yeah. I can remember Pierre didn't always listen in the, in the end. I mean, you have your dad in the corner having a little fit. Yes. So he was like, Pierre, you're making this a very, very difficult fight. Yeah. And we you give him a, a business and then Pierre would listen or not listen. Yeah. You know, but Pierre was always probably one of the fittest heavyweights. I've he, seen he, next he, to Yeah, Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's one fight he put his heart and soul into these fights. You know? Yes. And, uh, you know, it's not easy. In a box of trying to take in instructions, it's not easy for them, also, you know. It's easier said than done, basically. You know? Your dad often, often took flat from the media at that time yes. for being too careful of his fighters. Yes. And we've talked about how a loss shouldn't be the end of a world. In a retrospect, now looking at Pierre's career, your dad was probably right yes. uh, the way it, it ended up in the end. But where do you draw the balance between uh, taking a calculated risk and being too careful? Well, I think the way he did, the way he did it, I think it was perfect. He was offered to fight James with Tillis. Just off the Tillis. I remember that's where Tillis fought uh, the Floyd. No, 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 that's before the Floyd. That's before that, yeah. When Tillis yeah. Um, lost to Mike Tyson, Tyson he yes. just lost to Tyson. He went mm. 10 rounds with Tyson. Yes. My father said, no, let's build him up. That guy's too dangerous for him. You've taken mm. him up. Build him up slowly until he, he built him up with these soft touches, but he was gaining experience, and then mm. he basically got a good fight to him. They got a good fight to him with Jose Revolta. That was a very good fight, it I think. It's also there on YouTube now. Yes. Uh, and if you, listen, if you listen to Mike Tyson, mm. you know, he talks about his opponents. Who yeah. does he rate as his toughest opponents? He mentions about Jose Revolta. Very good fight. Yeah. That Pierre had to scramble the input to it really hurt Revolta to get through yeah. approve arm exactly. It was a war. And that for me took him to that next level, you know. And in conjunction with Rodney, Golden Gloves, they got him the bow fight. Yeah, yeah. The, the thing about Pierre Kutzer is last three fights. Yeah. He competed well, so Rod Hart didn't win, but it was really bow. Really who bow. went on to become the heavyweight champion. And I straight believe, after that. Straight after that. I believe he could have become become one of the heavyweight greats if he was more disciplined. The guy really had it all, I think. And then Frank Bruno. Who would also, also win the world title fight a while later against Oliver McCall and George and Foreman, George Foreman. who would yeah. regain the title at 45 yeah. out of nowhere. And you were in the corner for all three of those fights. Guys, yeah. Tell us about the Riddick Bow fight. Riddick Bow fight uh, at the pre fight medical. There was a bit of issue with respect to the politics. Rock Newman, his manager, yes. On. So they forget just been coming out of the post uh, yeah. yeah, moving to the new uh, system. Mm. And he seemed to have jumped on the bandwagon and, yeah. and attacked Pierre and my father, etc. But going into that fight, well, Pierre was, of course, a policeman, yes, well, which yes, that yes, doesn't yes, help. You know, it's a good topic for me. Because I remember when he walked into, when he went into the room, he never had the flag. Mm. Yet. Mm. The flag wasn't the new flag. It wasn't this out yet? Yes, it wasn't out yet. So we went in with no flag. Yes. Right. But um, I remember clearly just before that, uh, day before the fight, we met Lou Duva. Yes. Who actually trained Holyfield 
And he came up to my father, he said to my father, he says, your boy, those, those with no heart, your boy will take him out. So my father said, no, this guy's talking nice. If Rudy Bowes, if you'd Rudy Bowes beat Pierre Kutze, you'll be the next heavyweight champion. And he became the next heavyweight champion. Rudy Bowes had heart. Hey? Yeah, he had heart. Yes. Yes. Well, he he showed it. Holy, and that first Holyfield fight was an amazing fight. Great fight. One great of the heavyweight classics. Absolutely great fight, you know. So, and it was a hard fight for Pierre. Bo was just too big and too strong. But Pierre fought his heart out. And if you watch that fight, Bo hit him low. He hit him low a couple of times as well. Yeah, yeah. you know. And the ref, forced the referee's eye. But Bo won fair and square. And it was a tough fight, but Pierre gave it his all. And you know what? I always think if Pierre was fighting there, he would have won one of those titles. And, the yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. and then the Bruno fight in England. Yeah. Bruno, of course, very popular. Very popular, very strong. The yeah. big crowd. Yeah. Wembley Stadium, I think about close to 30,000. You know? Yeah. Um, also a hard fight. There was a stage where Pierre clipped him with a left hook. Yes. And then he just kind of yeah, he was a little bit yeah. and then he got, but got himself. Was, Bruno's yeah. a strong man. He's actually yeah. very strong. Mm. You know? Again, the size of Pierre, I think, the size of Bruno, I did outweigh Pierre. And that's what got the better of him. And George Foreman in the, yeah. you know, you think Foreman, you, you can outbox him yeah. and outmaneuver him. And Pierre was bouncy, bouncy yeah. on his toes. Yeah. You know? That was a pair yeah, to just box him. Was. It wasn't that boxing. great defense, but yeah. his feet was good. Move around and stay yeah. away from that yeah. power uh, right yeah. hand, you know. Yeah. But Foreman was so strong and um, Foreman could punch for that. And he had a tremendous jab. You know? mm. Even though it was this old Foreman of 45, that jab was like a stiff piston. Yes. And it went right through Pierre, you know. And, um, but he also put up a good account for himself there, you know. He just couldn't beat these guys at that level. And if we go, and well, there's no shame yeah, in that. There's no shame no, in that. You know, he, he'll always be remembered yeah. for that. You know? Yeah, he, yeah, he tried his best. Yeah. If you look at those three fights and you go through it in your mind, is there anything in those three that you think you could have done differently with Pierre, or was it just what it was? You know? I think it was what it was then. You know, I think um, it was just too good. It's just too good. To, yeah. And look, it proved. I mean, yeah. he became the undisputed, undisputed heavyweight yeah. champion of the world after mm. beating Holyfield straight off. Yes. That tells a story in its own. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Foreman tells a story after he knocked out Muro. A lot of people thought uh, Muro was beating Foreman mm. Mm. until Foreman tipped him. Yes. You know? Yes. And it's just, I, I think it is what it is. The man trained like a beast. He was so dedicated. He gave it his all. When someone mm. gives it the all, they train the hardest. Yes. Um, technically wise, he wasn't as sound as a really bow. Yes. But we, we try to work, my father tried to work on that and try to improve on it. But you know, you can only do. Uh, Work to a certain extent. You can work with what you have. have work with yeah, what you have, exactly. The rest is up to the fight of being able. And he did his best at that, and I think he achieved magnificent things there as a heavyweight. And now you've got Akani Puzi, I think it's safe to say, is your star fighter. Yes. Uh, he's the favourite to win this cruiserweight tournament. And uh, well, where do you see Akani going? You know, um, let's say, well, there's water under the bridge, let's say you get through the tournament. Would that then be international afterwards? Um, the way I've been building up Akani now, step by step, I'm happy with the progress. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to fight uh, Johnny Miller. And the reason being is simply because Johnny Miller has got tons of experience. And he's the type of guy that can push Akani to the limits. He can yes. expose Akani. Yes, he can. And mm -hmm. he can bring out the best in Akani. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're here to see. You with me. And that's why we wanted this fight so badly. You know? So. Should he be, and I believe he will be uh, uh, Johnny Miller. Yes. Should he be Johnny Miller? Then I'm thinking to myself, okay, we've got this final series. Mashitua. Yeah. Mashitua, you know, should go on. And then maybe two or three fights and get him a, a maybe a small title, world title. I think, oh, maybe. Something like, an, Something like, like that. Yes. By that time, Lorena might be done with that. By that time, he may have moved up. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then we can give him a few defenses and go from there. Yeah. Okay. You know? And That's then your other fighters, Rafi Wani is yes. also on the ball. He's fighting Ricardo Malajika. There must be a lot of things that you see in Malajika that you can exploit. His last fight wasn't yeah. a great performance. Yeah. Uh, and Moshuma, I think he's a bigger and rangier guy. I yeah. don't see them the next week are up close. And uh, so you're upset minded there. You want to derail with Malajika train? Yes. I'll tell you what. Um, Rafiba's record is very deceiving. He's been in tough. He's been in tough ones. Mm -hmm. Now, there's, there's there are three fights. The one fight that he uh, lost to, uh, uh, not this one, the one before, the one Lili Siacha. Yes. Siacha, yeah. He lost on a split decision. I don't know if actually it was a split decision. It was yes. a decision that I thought he won. Yes. Many people thought he won that fight. 
Yes. And that, that's a very good fighter. He beat Sabella, he beat Josh Petroyus. And mm -hmm. with this fight, last year, this time, he was... Uh, Joshua Stoddard. Josh, yeah, Josh Petroyus is everywhere. Josh Petroyus is doing really yes, well. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he beat Josh, Josh, Josh Petroyus on my mind because of the last fight. Yeah, because of everywhere yes. fight the other day, yes. So he, um, he, he beat Joshua Stoddard, right? But last year, this time, he was, he was supposed to fight in, uh, in Benga, 200. Mm. Goes to the way with the guy pulls out. He's desperate to win, he's desperate to fight, he's desperate to show. He may not have the skill of Madajiku, he's fast, he's got speed, he's flashy, but he's got the will and determination, and he's fit. Okay, you know? okay. And that's why we believe you've got a very good chance against Madajiku. It's a very interesting fight on the ball, you know. Yes. I, 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 I think, I think it's going to be an action packed fight. I honestly think it's going to be I a I think game. along with Rob Knapp and uh, Simon yes. Lala, that's the other fight that really, really want you to watch the rest. I think I know who the winner's going to be. Um, but uh, then your other fighters that you have currently, yes. who, do you, who do you also have in your stable? Angili Nyangani, mm -hmm. he's number one in South Africa. Wait. Mini Flower. Mini Flower. He's number eight in WBA. Mini oh, okay. Right. He's the guy that we're going to build up and eventually get him a world title fight. He's a very good prospect, a very yes. good boxer, tremendous power, and he's got determination. And he's got heart. Yes. So I think that's the next star we need to look at, you know? Um, next year, obviously because of COVID, things mm. slowed us down a bit. Mm. But hopefully next year we can get him back on track, get him a warm-up fight, and start fighting a few okay. bigger names. Yeah. He's only had 12 fights. Okay. 10 means one loss, one draw. Okay. He, lost his, he lost to the SA champion, and he, it was only his fourth fight. Uh, he was very raw. Yeah. yeah, but it was very raw. He was still raw then. Yes. You know? So, yeah. And, and then we go, uh, Shafir Munyan. Yeah, okay. Now, he's now a veteran. He, he's a veteran. Yeah. He won the SA title against all odds against uh, Mbula. Uh, Sipo Seto Mbula yes. from Eastern Cape. Yes, yes. And it was surprising. Yeah, very yeah. surprisingly. Yeah. And the ideal fight, and I think this will be a war, will be between him and Ayanda and Kozi. Uh, the Greyhound. Yeah. The Greyhound. I don't know if he still has it. He has a WBF belt. Yes, yes. But he's the top organization. To see who the best lightweight in Africa is. I must say South Africa in Africa. Yes. You know? So that will be, that's a fight I'm trying to work on to try to get going between mm. those two guys. You know? And what's interesting to me, looking at trainers, you know, sometimes if you, you, if you have a really, really great talent, you know, you almost, it's hard not to succeed. If, if one gives you a sugar ale in it, and yeah. say, yeah, work with a guy, 100%. it's going to be hard to mess it up. Mm. Okay. Uh, but what I like sometimes to see is if the trainer can take a guy who's not necessarily the most talented, Yes. Not necessarily the best assets or the amateur I've and turn it into something. And uh, you've got the heavyweight boy Alan yes. Neary yes. as well, if I, I pronounce that sure I'm right. And uh, that's a guy that I can see is a popular attraction. He brings the action, yes. he's big, he hits, huge heavyweight, uh, but he also takes every punch his opponent's throat. Yes. Uh, and uh, that that is a different kind of challenge yes. for you. I enjoy I enjoy that challenge because but then when he became SA amateur, you know, he's only had five amateur fights. He actually, yes. He's had five rounds in the amateurs. Yes, and he became SA champion. Yes, and people made fun of him. Yeah. People laughed yeah. at this guy. Yeah. You know? And he came to me at the age of 19, just before mm. he joined the amateur. Mm. So I was helping him a bit on the side. Mm. I said, go do the amateur, see what, what yeah. you feel about the sport. So he won. He became SA, heavy, SA amateur champion. Mm. And then he turned pro. Very raw. It was very clumsy. But in the last six months in training, Mm. He's been training often, he's training with the county, he's training with the other guys. I can see an improvement in him. He's got the height, he's got the punch, and he can take a shot. In his last fight, I told yes. you, he took every I shot. Him, I wanted him to go four rounds. But he kept going. Yes, yeah, he, he kept got the heart, yes, yeah, I yeah. wanted him to go four rounds. Yes. So I'm working on his technique, which is going to take, I'm saying it's a 10 year project. Mm. And I'm prepared mm. to spend 10 years with this guy. Till he gets where we do, we want to get where we want to. He's only 23 years old, there's no need to rush him. You know? Uh, if you so, can get him to develop a killer jab and yes, just get his hands up. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it will yeah, come. Yeah. It will come, but it takes time. Some guys pick up quicker than others. Mm. Mm. Um, you'll take a bit more time. But I'm thinking to myself, maybe end of 2021, maybe we'll be in a position to challenge for the SA heavyweight title. Yes. Maybe. Yes. Let's see how it goes. You know, with the number of fights we're going to get over in, 20, in the end of 2021. Okay. That's okay. what we are looking at. All right. Leaving that aside, we have. We have a lot of action this weekend as well. Yeah. We've got Chris Van Yeren taking on Jerome Ennis. Yeah. A huge ask again for Chris. Eh? 
in the past because I uh, so much respect for him, absolutely backing up, trying to make it there in America. He's done quite well, won quite a few fights. He was thrown in against Errol Spence Jr. It was supposed to be the next big thing. He fought valiantly, he got stopped. Errol Spence Jr. is now the big thing. Yes, and now you know, he's got Jerome Innes, who's also supposed to be the next big thing. Absolutely. So he's kind of like a gatekeeper. Uh, how do you see that going for Chris? You know, Chris reminds me of a Pierre Kutzer. Yes. Fighting these big names. Mm. And to, to, to get an opportunity to fight these big names, it's, it's, it's a big, big plus to your, to your career. Mm. Because years afterwards, even if you mm. lose to them, yeah. people will talk about you. Yes. And they will talk good things about you. Yes. Not that you're a world champion, but you, you, you put your heart and soul in fighting mm. those fights. In, 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 in those particular fights. Chris is one of those guys, I think. This fight is going to be a tough fight. The guys at 26 fights, 23 knocks, I okay, 24 knockouts. Yeah. I think we mustn't, you know, a lot of people say, don't look at records, but I think they're both in this guy. It's going to be a tough fight. And sure. He checks the form book so far. Yeah, he I looks. He hasn't looks, really been tested yet, but he been checks the form book. Yeah, but, but Chris, is a, Chris is a tough man. He's a, he can box also, you know. Yes. He may surprise him, but I just think it's a, he, it could be another Errol Spence. Maybe it could be. I think know? that's a consensus opinion, although we all yeah. think uh, Chris does it. Yes. The other, the biggest fight this weekend, uh, Canelo Alvarez yeah. going for put the yeah. actual world super middleweight title, the WBA and ring champion, Callum Smith. Much bigger, taller guy. How do you see that going up? Okay. Uh, only recently has Alvarez impressed me, you know. Mm. I felt when he fought Mayweather, he just got into a little rut and Mayweather just walked around. And, you know, That's just a young Alvarez. Young Alvarez, yeah, yeah. but he still had a lot of fights. Yes. 45 yeah. fights or something like that. Yeah. I, I think Alvarez has got this one. Callum, they'd say, may surprise, you know, but... Um, a bit foolish to write him off, no, he's a good fighter, no, he's got a, a lot of advantages there. Advantage, absolutely, but I think the pressure of, of um, and those body shots, especially the left foot to the liver. Well, Canelo, a very good oh, body punch. Devastating, right? devastating. devastating. Yeah. And I think maybe that, he has, he has the edge over Callum there, you know. Yeah. And yeah. you know, there are surprises yeah. in boxing, but I can't yeah. see it. Yeah. Oh, we have so many surprises this year already, eh? Absolutely. Uh, the, the normal beating with Dong Wen and things like that. that yeah. When I saw that, I was such a shock. I couldn't that was believe. shocking, yeah. Absolutely, I couldn't believe what happened there. But that's boxing. Yeah. That's why I say always my advice to boxers, just stay humble. Because if there's one sport that can show you up as a human being and break you, it's the game of boxing. Right, you know? definitely. It's a tough, tough game, man. Eh? Okay, Alan, we're going to leave you to get back to your fighters. Sure, thank Thanks you. for taking the time to talk to us. And hopefully we do it soon and good luck for everybody on Saturday.